I pray for Karen, Lord, as you continue to touch her body this morning and strengthen that body and heal her, Lord. Pray that you bring her peace, Father God, and the presence of the Lord would be very real in her life. Father, as she seeks you and spends time with you, touch her body, bring healing in every area this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for those this morning that have been impacted by this COVID-19 virus. Lord, those that have uh, been impacted physically, maybe they've contracted the virus, maybe they know a loved one, maybe they've been impacted financially in their jobs, Lord, where they've had reduced hours and been laid off. We ask that you just meet every need that's related to the, the impact and the effects of this virus. We believe you to heal those that have been affected. Lord, that you would just, not just heal their body, but drive the virus out of their body. Lord, just remove any remnants of this in Jesus' name. Father, in fact, we take a stand as the spirit-empowered body of Christ under the authority of Jesus Christ. Your word says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you, and you have deputized us in that authority. And we take authority this morning in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, and we command that this virus be eradicated around the world. Lord, that it would diminish, it would cease and desist. In Jesus' name, we take authority. The word says, every knee shall bow, that every name will submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And this virus, this COVID, Jesus. this corona, it's just a name that has to submit to the power and the authority yes. Yes. of Jesus Christ. And everybody yes. said amen, amen and give the Lord your best praise. Go ahead. Come on. Woo. Some of you came in this morning and we're not really hugging or high-fiving or uh, breathing on each other, so we've learned to give the elbow of love. When you come in here, you get the elbow of love. And if you don't behave, you get the elbow of love. So just watch how you come in, man. We might go all dusty roads on you at some point. You can go ahead and grab a seat. We're going to get ready. Can you guys hear me okay or do I need a mic? Everybody good? It's a pretty small uh, building. Well, we're glad to have everybody with us this morning. We have some fresh faces come to visit us. That's always an honor and a pleasure. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. We're so glad you're here. And um, you, you came in at a good time. We're right on the ground floor of a brand new series. So uh, for those of you watching live stream, either on Facebook or our website, Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate your faithfulness. We appreciate the fact that you've been so consistent and faithful. So I want you to do a couple of things for me this morning. Feel free to type in comments. I can't see them, but I review these after service to see who's paying attention. So type in some comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we are getting a lot of people watching from various parts of the country and some other countries. So please just drop a note and say, hey, I'm watching from Hawaii. Especially if you're watching from Hawaii, then send me your email because I want to come see you so I can personally minister to you on the island. I think that's what God is calling me to do here, where you're watching from because uh, we just like to know where the, uh, where the gospel is being reached and where it's being uh, received. So this morning, thank you. We love you guys and uh, stay faithful. You guys have done so great staying connected. You know, I don't like the term social distancing because we're really not, we're not, I don't want us to be socially distanced. We can stay connected via Facebook, live stream, texts, phone calls. I mean, there's no reason to be disconnected. I think we're physically distancing, which would make a little bit more sense. But listen, church, I implore you, stay connected. We have so many ways to stay connected. We have a, our Sunday morning live stream. Uh, if you're a little braver than that and you want to come into the sanctuary, we are uh, practicing physical distancing. Uh, everybody's in masks. I'm not in masks because I'm about 60 feet away from my closest person. And like I said last week, you really want me to hide all this? I don't think so. 
Um, so we're, 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 we have hand sanitizers, we're wiping things down. Man, there is not a germ alive in this building, I promise you. So we're a pretty safe environment. So if you want to come, we'd love to have you Sunday mornings. If you're watching from the comfort of your home, I understand that, and I'm just glad you're here either way. Wednesday nights, we have a Bible study called Wednesday, Connect on Wednesdays. If you're interested in that, shoot me a message uh, with your email. I'll send you the information for Wednesday nights. Uh, you need to be invited to the Zoom call so we don't get any hackers in there. And uh, what we do is we take Sunday morning's message, and we bring it to the table on Wednesday night, and it's really your Bible study. You discuss what the Lord has ministered to you. You bring your perspective and your experience. And it really only works if you show up and if you participate. Otherwise, we're just rehashing uh, the pastor's message, and you don't want to do that. We need to hear your perspective. We have a... Uh, Cornerstone Connection on Sunday morning at 8.30, Miss Peggy's class. Uh, marvelous class. We're in the book of Daniel, and uh, it's just going fantastic. That's at 8.30 on Sunday morning. We'll send you a Zoom uh, invite for that as well, but I'll need your emails to do that. Our youth groups are meeting. Uh, our groups are getting together. So look, while we're physically distanced, church, listen to me. It is important to stay connected. I said in a... Uh, video I sent out yesterday that um, we need each other and I think we need each other now more than ever I don't know about you but when I'm isolated it's easy to live in my own head I don't know what your head looks like but my head sometimes can be this dark lonely cavern where negative things grow exponentially anybody with me so I need to be around yeah man I need to be around I need my wife to pull me out of that dark place sometimes and she usually lures me out with a brownie or some watermelon or something. So it all works really well. But um, I just, uh, I, we've got to stay connected. Otherwise, we're in places that are not healthy. So above all things, church, stay connected. Reach out to one another. Check on one another. Don't assume everybody's good. Check on your uh, fellow uh, uh, storehouse member. Make sure everybody's happy and healthy and make sure everybody has their needs met. Okay, if you're with me this morning, say amen. All right, as we have some more guests come in getting settled, let's get into the Word. We've got so much to cover this morning. I've got, I am ex super excited about this series. We, uh, if you missed last week, we launched a new series, and it is called Activated. I love the tagline that the Lord gave me. Unleashing the Spirit-empowered, gospel-bearing, world-changing church. That's the quietest this church has ever been after the most remarkable statement we've ever read. So we're going to do that again. What is this? What is like some of you are like, what? what? What did he say? Our series is about unleashing, listen to me, the spirit empowered our world changing church. Say, woohoo! Okay, you know, who, you know who that is, right? Who is that? It's you. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's me. I am the spirit-empowered, gospel-bearing, world-changing church. That's me. See, somewhere along the lines, we've settled in to what I call... We've just settled into this mediocrity in our Christianity. God didn't call us to be mediocre. Nobody strives. I, you know, my goal in life is, I just want to be mediocre. I want to be pretty good at something. It's not a goal. That's what you acquiesce to when you're lazy. Amen. <laughs> oh, man, toes are pulling in. I want to be the spirit-empowered church. Amen. So let's get into it. If you missed last week, not a big deal. You can catch it on our website, www.thestorehouse.church. There's a tab that says sermons. Go there. You can watch last week's sermon called uh, Establishing the Climate. And what we did last week was we're, we really focused on this transition uh, between the Gospels and going into the book of Acts. So the short version of last week's message is this. We, we, we brought the light. See, here's the thing. Church, you know me long enough that I think we read the Bible a lot of times like a story. And because we know the ending, we, 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 we miss out on the emotional impact of the people involved in what's going on. So last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the disciples who had spent 
three or more years walking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, sleeping under the stars with Jesus, watching his miracles, participating in his miracles, feeding 5,000, feeding 15,000. Oh, by the way, healing people with leprosy and people that were mute. And oh gosh, by the way, raising the dead. <laughs> and now suddenly, unexpectedly, he's dead and he's buried in a tomb and we can't get to him. And I'm telling you, their world is crushed. They've lost everything. And then we said, spoiler alert, the story doesn't end there. Thank God the story doesn't end there. Jesus comes out of the tomb. He speaks to Mary and he speaks to the women and he tells the women, he says, look, I want you to run back and tell the disciples. And I love in Mark, because Mark's the only one who adds these words. Run back and tell the disciples and make sure you tell Peter. Now, Mark says, and Peter. I'm giving you the Pastor E version. Go back Tell the world, tell the disciples, make sure that, you, make sure that Peter knows this. Because of all the disciples that are feeling really bad, Peter is at his lowest. He denied me three times, even though I warned him it was going to happen. He's on the verge of walking away. You need to go tell Peter, because here's the message. There is nothing you have ever done or can do where God wouldn't say to you, I'm alive and I'm here for you. Go tell Peter. Make sure Peter knows this. So they go and they tell the disciples. Now, put yourself in that emotional place. They've lost everything. <laughs> the Bible says they're hiding for their lives. Because we talked about the Jews wanting to kill them and the Romans. You know, they're not real happy. They're neutral, but they'll do whatever it takes to keep the peace. They're literally hiding for their lives. And then in a locked room, Jesus appears. Doesn't knock on the door, doesn't ring the bell, doesn't look at the ring camera and say, woohoo, hey, just shows up. And the disciples, <laughs> I love the scripture that says, and the disciples were filled with joy. You think? The world that they lost is now alive and come back to them. So that's our, that was, that was um, week one, if you missed that. That was the, believe it or not, that was the short version. So here's what we're going to do. Week two, we're going to actually get into the first chapter of Acts. And I'm, those of you who like titles, I know some people like their sermons titled. So what I'm going to call this, since we're transitioning from the Gospels into the book of Acts, I've titled this week's message, The Rest of the Story. How many of you are Paul Harvey fans? Like me, two of us who are over 50. Okay, y'all need to look up Paul Harvey because his tagline was he would bring a news event to the radio and then, he would, and then he would say, but what you didn't hear on the news, and he'd bring this marvelous backstory. And at the end of all that, he would say, and now you know the rest of the story. And you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't end at the book of John. It moves on. So I got a little chart up here I want you to look at. This is a really cool comparison. We're, I hope you can see that okay. I, I didn't pick the best color. So what we're doing is we're transitioning from the Gospels into the book of Acts. And as I started developing this, I saw this pattern that was really cool. So here's what we're doing. The Gospels, i got to read my notes to make sure I got it right. So in the Gospels, we see the Son of Man who came to die for our sins. That's who Christ was. But in the book of Acts... We see the Son of God coming in the power of the Holy Spirit. we got to make this transition because this is what energizes the church. In the Gospels, we saw what Christ began to do. But in the book of Acts, we see what he continues to do by the work of the Holy Spirit through the disciples. Say amen. In the Gospels, it tells us of a crucified and risen Savior. But in the book of Acts, we get to see an ascended and exalted Lord and leader who is very much alive. Say amen. In the Gospels, uh, we heard Christ's teaching. But in the book of Acts, this is amazing, we get to see the effects of his teachings 
on the acts of the disciples. Isn't that amazing? Say amen. I am so excited that we get to watch how God builds and develops the first church. And that here's what I want you, well, let me not get ahead of myself. So let me read this to you. Ready? The book of Acts is not so much about a record of the acts of the apostles. Because really, when you read the whole book, it mostly focuses on Peter and Paul. So it's not really about the acts of the apostles. It's not so much about that as it is about the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles' lives. How do I know that? The Holy Spirit is mentioned about 27 times in the book of Acts. And if you do the math, that's at least once every chapter. So as we study this, I want you to look for the work of the Holy Spirit throughout every chapter as we go. I also want you to note that the word witness is used more than 30 times throughout the book. So we're going to see this connection between the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and how he activates us. That's why our series is called Activated. How he activates us and presses us and anoints us into service to change the world. If that sounds like something you want to be part of, say amen. amen. All right, are you ready to go to Acts chapter? All that to get you to Acts chapter 1. Are you ready? All right, let's go to Acts chapter 1. But before we do that, we're going to, <laughs> we're going to tell you just a little bit about who, who wrote it and who the letter was to. So let's talk about who is the author. Who knows who the author is of Acts? Up oh, too late. The answer's up there. Who knows who the author is of Acts? Really, three hands went up. The answer's on the board, people. This is a, we're giving you the answers to the test. Because this is in the test when you go to heaven. God's going to ask this. I'm pretty sure at the pearly gates. So, Acts was written by Luke. Who is Luke? Well, what, did, what else do we know Luke from? Hello, the book of Luke. <laughs> this isn't rocket science, guys. It's Bible 101. We know Luke because he wrote the book of? Luke. There you go. <laughs> we know Matthew because he wrote? Matthew. You're getting this, aren't you? And John wrote? John. And? And? There you go, wrote a lot. So, and we know, okay, so the author is Luke. What do we know about Luke? Well, we know Luke is a physician. We know that Luke was most likely a Gentile. And obviously he was well-educated. But what you may not know is that Luke wasn't one of the original 12 disciples. Although he had followed the Lord for most of the Lord's ministry, he came along later, after, uh, later at the point of ministry, and he, we know from evidence that he knew many of the apostles. So Luke wasn't one of the inside original 12. And he pens this letter that turns out to be the book of Acts. Now, um, we know, why do we know that? Luke is amazingly humble. He doesn't identify himself in either of his writings. But he writes the letter to the same person. Who's the recipient? The recipient is a man named Theopolis. What do we know about Theopolis? Not a whole lot, but here's what's cool. His name means one who loves God. That's a really cool name. When my wife and I have our next child, if it's a boy, we're naming him Theopolis. <laughs> See, that's really funny because I'm kind of old. I just said I'm old. I didn't say you were old. You're just older than me. That's all I'm saying. So we know that uh, Theopolis he writes the Gospel of Luke he pens that letter, and he also sends it to Theopolis. Because in Luke chapter 1, verse 3, he says, To my most excellent Theopolis. So what do we know about him? Not a whole lot, but here's what I've gathered in my studies. We, because Luke refers to him as most excellent Theopolis in the book of Luke, that is a title that gives him some prominence and some stature. So most uh, um, people who study the word believe that he was either a Roman official or he had some very high position in the Roman government and had wealth. It's quite uh, um, possible that he was Luke's patron. In other words, when Luke wrote things, it was Theopolis' job to make sure to see that the writings were copied and distributed. Now, they didn't have printing things out manually by people who were called scribes. scribes. Good, see, you guys are getting this. Uh, scribes would literally write things out one page at a time and then distribute the writings throughout the churches and throughout... Uh, throughout the world. So, high likelihood that Theopolis was Luke's patron and took care of all that. So, now you know who wrote it. You know who the letter is going to. Let's jump in. Acts chapter 1. Are you ready? Say, Amen. amen. 
He starts out by saying this, Dear Theopolis, say that with me, Dear Theopolis. Dear Theopolis. That's only so I can get a drink. In my first book, I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the time he began his work until the day he was taken up to heaven. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen as his apostles. For 40 days after his death, he appeared to them many times in many ways that proved beyond a doubt, listen, that he was alive. They saw him, they talked with him about the kingdom of God. Six points I have this morning, and don't panic, we're going to get through all of them really quickly, I promise. Six takeaways from chapter one I want you to write down, and then be ready to discuss these on Wednesday night. First thing, number one, Jesus is very much alive. I love what Luke, when he writes to Theopolis, he adds, this, he adds this part of the verse. He says, look, for 40 days after his death, he appeared to them, to many people, many times in ways that proved beyond a doubt that he was very much alive. You ever hear stories about people faking their death? It happens. Most people do it for the insurance money. How many of you have enough insurance money that you can fake your death? No one. <laughs> Not me. And I read these stories and I watch movies where people have faked their death so that they're either their family can uh, inherit something or, I don't know, for whatever reason. But here's the thing. By law, if the alleged dead person is seen by three people that can document it in court, that person is no longer dead. Just three people. The Bible records 13 different times that Jesus appeared to people after his resurrection. 13. Paul tells the church at Corinth that Jesus is very much alive when he says this in 1 Corinthians. He said, then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers all at once. Is that more than three people? Yes, it is. He appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom were still alive at this time, although some have died. Now, I would kind of take Paul's word for it, because I think if there's anyone who knows that Jesus is alive and can, and can certainly confirm that, it's, it's the Apostle Paul. Paul has one of the most remarkable encounters with the resurrected Christ recorded in the Bible. And we're going to get there in a few weeks, so just remember that thought. But the bottom line is this. Jesus is very much alive. The resurrected Christ, listen to me, is the foundation, the very foundation of our faith. Are you hearing me? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what are we doing here? Everything we believe is based on his... Look, at he wasn't just a good teacher. The world has a lot of good teachers. He wasn't just um, a rabbi. The world has a lot of rabbis. He wasn't just a good storyteller. The world has a ton of good storytellers. What separates Jesus from all other religious leaders is the fact that all other religious leaders can be dug up and their remains still found in the grave. What Jesus brings to the table is the resurrection power of God that allows us to have our sins forgiven and to resurrect our, ourselves, to cheat death, to overcome death, and spend eternity in the presence of God. Say amen. It's a great place to get excited. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Well, pastor, that's very narrow-minded. It is very narrow-minded. I'm a simple guy. Jesus, and you know what? This isn't my idea. This is Jesus' idea. He says, oh, by the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to God except through me. So my, not my words. I'm sorry, celebrities like Oprah and other people who think that all roads eventually lead to heaven. I'm sorry. The Bible says broad is the road to destruction, but narrow is the way to heaven. Why is it narrow? Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sign Jesus. You say, Pastor, that's really narrow-minded. <laughs> you know what? 
It's not narrow-minded. I, it's simple. I like simple. I tell you guys that all the time. You want to confuse me? Take me to a restaurant that has an eight-page menu. I will sit there going, I have no idea. Take me to a restaurant where the choice is you can have hamburgers and a milkshake or a hot dog and a milkshake. I'm okay. I'll take a hamburger and a hot dog and a milkshake. <laughs> I like simple choices, man. I don't want to have to scratch my head about this. So, yes, it's simple. Jesus made it simple. He's very much alive. It is his resurrection that is the foundation of what we believe. Without his resurrection, you and I are just a club. I don't want to be a club. I mean, I love you guys. But if I can't have the Holy Spirit working in my life because, and my sins forgiven and the opportunity to live forever in the presence of my loving Heavenly Father, then I've got nothing without His resurrection. Say amen. Let's go back to verse 4. You still with me? Say amen. Verse 4, and Luke continues to tell them, And when they came together, he gave the disciples this order, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Number two, God's promises are true. He gives his, remember when we studied uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus promised the disciples what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he died, the disciples were discouraged, he resurrected, they see Jesus again, and one of the first things he does in the 40-day period is he reminds them, look, I need you to go do this, here's your instructions, and this is where the promise of God is going to happen in your life. Amen. Uh, Jesus doesn't forget it. He is not a man that he can lie. God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. Say amen. Amen. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit was given in the Gospels. And here's the thing I want you to see. It's about to be fulfilled with the obedience of the disciples. Here's a word we don't hear a lot in church anymore. Obedience. You know that God's promises, most of them, the vast majority of God's promises, are an if-then proposal. I'll give you a few. I don't have these scriptures. You can talk to me later or look in Exodus. God says in Exodus, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Deuteronomy says, If you obey my commands, then you will be blessed. If you do not obey my commands, then you will be cursed. If you forget the Lord and follow other gods, then you will be destroyed. If you carefully observe all these commands that I'm giving you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you. In the book of John, Jesus says, if anyone keeps my words, then he will never see death. Are you getting the picture here? He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Say amen. You know, we have a responsibility and a part to, to step up and be obedient to the Word of God. We've had this movement in the church where we have this sloppy grace. Well, Pastor, I'm under grace. Yes, you are under grace, but grace is not a license for you to live your own life and ask Jesus, kind of carry him along conveniently when you need him. Jesus is not a genie in a lamp that we rub, and when we need him, Aladdin pops out and grants us three wishes. <laughs> One of the terms that we use in Christianity that really bothers me is, I invited Jesus into my life. Okay, I get that, and I've heard it since I was 10 years old, but you know what? I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to come in to, be, to partake in my, my life. Matter of fact, the Bible says that I need, to, I need to yoke up with him. If any man is going to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If I'm not willing to lay down my life, his words then I am not worthy to follow him. Now, there's a balance where Jesus has given us a life and wired us certain ways and given us desires and given us purpose. I get all that, but you know what? I didn't invite him along to come be part of my train wreck of a life. Come on. There's a responsibility here for me to observe and obey the word of God. Let me give you two of my favorite if-then promises in the Bible. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the what? 
the desires of your heart. Here's my version. If I delight myself in the Lord, then the Lord will give me the desires of my heart. Now, let me tell you one thing I believe that means. I don't think that means, hey, Lord, I really like Corvettes. God's going to give me a Corvette. What I believe this means is this. If I, when I delight myself in the Lord, he will start to deposit things in my heart that are godly and those become my desires. Do you see the difference? If I follow God, my desires change. My desires shift. He doesn't, he doesn't wipe out my personality. He doesn't wipe out my starts to adjust them and he centers my focus on the things that delight him and those desires the things that delight him those become the desires of my heart proverbs 3 5 and 6 says this trust in the lord with all your heart never rely on what you think you know remember that the lord in everything you do and he will show you the right way here's my version of trusting in the lord it says if i trust in the lord with all my heart Here's the hard part. If I never rely on what I think I know, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize there's a lot I don't know. The older I get, the more I realize there was a, there's a lot that I thought I knew, but it was wrong. <laughs> if I remember the Lord in everything I do, then he will show me the right way. These are if-then conditions. So what are you getting at, Pastor? Here's what I'm getting at. God has amazing countless promises for your life but we have a responsibility to follow in obedience to the word of the Lord if we think we can just live recklessly and the blessings of God are going to flow upon us you have been misled and deceived and I know because in in 35 years of ministry my wife and I have talked to a lot of people and they wonder, Pastor, why is my life, I don't understand, the devil is after me. This is going on, that's going on, my life's a wreck. You know what, what we really want to say is, you know what, you're not walking in obedience. And when we point that out, people get upset. But I'm not going to sugarcoat the word. Jesus says, follow me, obey me, if you love me, you'll what? You'll obey my, you'll follow after me. You can't live your own messy life and expect, that guy. doesn't happen you might have an okay life I get that but what are you missing out on because you stubbornly refuse to yield one area of your life what are you missing out on by holding on to that area now I know it's quiet in here so say oh my okay. and, and say say move on pastor here we go let's go let's pick up uh, let's pick up verse 6 so number two was his promises are true. Verse six, when the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my father's own authority, and it's not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power. Say that with me, filled with power. I want to park right there. I'm not going to finish this verse yet. We're going to come back to that in just a minute, Lauren. So number three, they will be filled with power. This is the critical moment of the book of Acts. This is our pivotal point from living in fear on our own strength to walking, being activated. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Say amen. And he tells them, you will be filled with power. We're going to see when this happens next week. But it comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Something we don't hear almost anything about in churches nowadays. But what the church needs today is the empowerment and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Say amen. <laughs> can I tell you, listen, can I tell you something? This series birthed in my heart two years ago. Amen. And God kept putting other series. No, you have to go here. Go here. Go here next. And do you know that for two years, we've worked up to the book of Acts. And if you go back and look at my preaching for the last two years, you'll see that it was all moving. Your pastor's not crazy. He's got kind of a plan. And the Holy Spirit kind of likes to walk along and say, hey, buddy, let's take him here. And I say, oh, it's your church. Let's go. And I just write as he gives it to me. 
So all of that accumulated. So two years ago, this is wonderful. How did this start? My wife and I were at the Foursquare Convention in Seattle, Washington. And one of the speakers stood up. I can't remember her name. Please forgive me. She was marvelous. I can tell you what she spoke on. She spoke on the woman at the well. And in a, in a context, I'd never heard it before. You know, I'll be honest with you. I, I, this is my confession. I've always kind of looked at the woman of the well, and I've jokingly, as I've preached it, I've said, dude, you've been married five times. The problem might be you. Come on. You had to think that, right? Five times. It's a common denial. She brought out this whole social implication that just made me weep. I mean, it just made me weep. It was amazing. But here's what, here's what the speaker reminded me of. I got saved really young. I was 10 years old. Let me do the math for you. It was 1970. I'm 60. I'll save you the math. And Sunday school. I love Sunday school. I memorized scripture, we sang songs, I loved church. And we used to sing this song. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well within my soul spring up a well and make me whole spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly we would say i've got a river of life and i was in this meeting and i here's where the lord dropped this series in my life i'm in this meeting and i said to myself where's that river of life flowing out of me where's that power that makes the lame to walk and the blind to see where's that power that i should possess that opens prison doors and and sets the captive free where's that power in the church oh i think it's missing you want to know why we're not effective we're missing that power of the holy spirit <laughs> He says, but you will be filled with power. Man, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit in your life, I implore you, yeah. ask the Lord, seek the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit in filling that gives us that dunamis, that dynamite, that power, that gives us the wisdom, the guidance, the words we need to speak. It gives us... Yeah. <laughs> to come. He says, when you stand before authority, he will give you the words to speak. Where's that power? Lord, I need a fresh filling of that power. <laughs> what if I just said, Jesus wants you healed. Set down those crutches. Jesus wants you to walk. He makes the lame to walk. What if we laid hands on people and their sight came back? We think, well, that's so incredible. That was great in the Bible. That's our power. Yeah. That's our power. Jesus Christ and the back of the church, the same yesterday and today and forever. Why aren't we walking in that power? Listen, church, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the activation of our powerful, gospel-bearing, world-changing mission, period. Without it, you'll never be a world-changer. How important is this? <laughs> I love this statement Jesus makes. This is my version of what Jesus says to the disciples. He tells them, go and tarry in Jerusalem. And while you're there, the power, the Spirit of God will come upon you. But you know what? After that, they can't stay. They got to go out and do what he's called them to do. So my version of that statement is this. Jesus is saying, hey, look, you need to sit still till that happens. It's a lesson for the church. You don't, don't go try to be effective without the Holy Spirit in your life. You're not going to be an effective witness. Hmm. Some of you trying to walk in the world, walk in the church, and, and tell people how great the church is. Don't witness to me when you've been drinking. Oh, now, pastor, don't go. Don't witness to me while you're smoking. Come on now. I think that's a bad witness. You're no different than the world. 
This may be my last Sunday here at the storehouse. I've enjoyed being your pastor for the last five years. Let's preach the truth. Jesus says we're to be called out, set apart. We're to be an example. We are to be like Christ. When people look at us, we are the light of the world. They should see Jesus. If we smell like the world, talk like the world, drink like the world, act like the world, we are not like Jesus. Say amen. And you know what? You're not going to get there without the power of the Holy Spirit. Our flesh wants what our flesh wants. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us. Say amen. Say, move on, Pastor. So Jesus says this, until this happens, until you get the power, you need to stay. (laughs) But after you get the power, you can't stay. (laughs) you got this fire in you that's going to empower you and energize you, and it's going to engage you into ministry. You can't sit still. We're going to read in a little bit where the, where the apostles are, are standing before the, the government and the government is trying to shut them down. And the, the disciples say, look, I don't know what you can do. Do what you want with us. All I know is I cannot help but speak that which I've seen and heard through Jesus Christ. That's the fire God wants to put in you. Say amen. All right, so number three, they'll be filled with power. Then he goes on to say, let me pick up my verse here, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the fourth, number four, they will be his witnesses. (laughs) Now, how many of you have read this verse before? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. You've read that before? And I've always looked at that as a geographical uh, um, representative. So here's, here's what it looks like in, in geography. Jerusalem is their hometown. Judea is their homeland. So, so it would be like, you're going to be my witnesses in Fern Park and Florida. Samaria is their neighbor. But then we want you to go to Georgia and witness to those bulldogs up there. That's a college team. That's going to be really funny when college football starts again. And, and witness to the neighbor. Then I want you to go to the ends of the earth, which is really all of Rome, because at the time, the Roman Empire was the entire world. Are you with me? Say amen. But this is really more than about geography. Let me tell you what this represents. It's, it'll blow your mind. So Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, where are they right now? Where are the disciples right now? They're in Jerusalem. Why are they there? They went in for the Passover. They used to trek to Jerusalem constantly. That's where Jesus would go to the temple. That's where the disciples would go to the temple. What's in Jerusalem? The temple where they worshipped. The very temple that contained the very leaders that conspired to put Jesus to death. And we're going to see in the book of Acts that the disciples go to the temple in Jerusalem to preach the gospel. The very place where the... um, where the um, Pharisees, the Sanhedrin specifically, rose up to have Jesus tortured and executed. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is sending them back to the very place that cost him his life. I don't know how many of us could take that challenge. So so that's Jerusalem. Then he talks about Judea. Well, Judea is not easy to preach in either because that was the seat of Judaism. So to tell the Jewish people that the law of Moses really doesn't mean a hill of beans in comparison to God's grace was not going to be an easy task. They had to go in with this fresh gospel, the good news, that it's not about your works, it's not about keeping the law, it's not about any of this, it's God's grace, period. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. So to do that in a land that is rife with Judas is very difficult. Then he says, go to Samaria. (laughs) We know about the Samaritans because Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans most likely hated each other. So now Jesus is telling his disciples, these brand new believers who've never preached in their life, to go preach to the people that hate them. And quite possibly the people that they hate. Jesus is saying, that's your task. We're going to be called to carry the gospel to places that will be uncomfortable and very difficult, but where the gospel is much needed. Can you say amen? Amen. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit, because on our own we wouldn't go. 
We'd, we'd find reasons to not go. But Jesus says the second greatest commandment is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? It's that obnoxious person at work. It's the neighbor across the street that just nobody gets along with. Go to your neighbor. Share the gospel. Say amen. All right, pick it up. Verse 9. Here we go. We're going to pick the pace up. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away. When two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. So my point number five, Jesus is coming back. Yes. Hmm. His ministry on earth may be complete, but Jesus now reigns and sits at the right hand of the Father where he is still very much ministering to us as he sends us the Holy Spirit and as he ever intercedes on our behalf. Say amen. But here's the kicker for today. Be very aware, be very aware, be very aware that soon and perhaps very soon, Jesus is very much returning to gather his followers and to judge mankind. Now, if you're my age, I've heard that since I got saved at 10 years old. And you say, well, you know what? You've made it 50 years and he hasn't come back yet. Yes, but guess what? I am one day closer. And I can tell you, if you don't think he's coming back soon, open your Bible and watch the news. And if, you're, if you have half a brain to connect spiritual things, you'll see that Jesus says that these signs will happen and they will increase in rapidness as a woman going into... Look at the stuff that's coming on. I'm still waiting for the murder hornets. They're going to be here any day, according to the news. Earthquakes everywhere, pestilence, plague. Come on, it's all right in front of us. Jesus is coming back. You know, it's funny because I kind of relate that in the church, you don't hear it preached much, but this church, Jesus is coming back, and you should be obedient to the Lord. That's what this church preaches, and that's what we believe. How many of you right now, if there was a car alarm in the parking lot, would stand up and go see if it's your car? That's the message that Jesus is coming back. We're numb to it. We don't respond to it. Pastor, do you know when? I don't know when. And I don't know if I'm taking post-trib, mid-trib, pre-trib. Here's what I know. I'm a realist. I believe in the real trib. My goal in life is to live like he's coming today, but preach the gospel like I still have some time. Because if I am always ready, it doesn't matter when he comes back. See, many people think, well, I'll get ready as he gets closer. No, Jesus talked about ten virgins. Five were foolish because they didn't get oil ahead of time. When the bridegroom came, they tried to go get oil, and Jesus said, no, 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 you can't do that now. You had your opportunity. So people say, well, when I hear that trumpet, I'll repent. Dude, you will be left behind. I used to jokingly say, when I hear that trumpet, I'm grabbing my wife's ankles. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to happen, man. That's not reality. Reality is be ready now. Can you say amen? All right, let's get to the last point because this is, I think, the best point of chapter one. Are you still with me? Wave, wave, say wave. All right, this is a lot of scripture and I'm only going to read a portion and then I want you to read the rest of it when you go home because I have like five minutes to finish. So here we go. We're going to read verse 20, 12 to 26, but I'm going to so then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a mile away, a half mile away from the city. They entered the city and they went up to the room where they were staying. Now this is interesting. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Patriot, and Judas, the son of James. You do know there was two Judases, right? Okay. Judas 1, Judas 2. Judas 1 is no longer in the picture. They gathered frequently to pray as a group together with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Then he goes on to talk about, well, let me read this. A few days later, there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 in all, and Peter stood up to speak. My friends, he said, the scripture had to come true in which the Holy Spirit, speaking through David, made a prediction about Judas who was the guide for those who arrested Jesus. Judas was a member of our group, for he had been chosen to have a part in our work. 
with the money that Jesus, Judas got for his evil act, he bought a field where he fell to his death, he burst open, and all of his insides spilled out. And people say the Bible is boring. I say, contrarily, the Bible is action-packed. So we know this, Judas hung himself, right? You know Judas hung himself. But yet, now we're saying, well, he, 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 uh, all his guts spilled out. So what most people believe is he bought a field, there was a hill on that field, he wrapped a rope around a branch hanging off the hill, he hung himself, was there long enough that at some point, either the branch broke or something happened, fell to the ground, split himself open, and his bowels dumped out on the ground. The Bible is anything but boring. Say amen. <clears throat> For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his house become empty, and may no one live in it. It is also written, May someone else take his place of service. Stay with me. Is they, they gather some names and they say, we need to replace Judas. It's important to replace him. We need to replace him with someone who has walked with Jesus the same amount of time we have. And they narrow it down to two people. They narrow it down to Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, and a young man named Matthias. They prayed, Lord, you know the thoughts of everyone, so show us which of these two men you have chosen to serve the apostle in the place of Judas, who left to go to the place where he belongs. Then they drew lots between the two men, and they chose Matthias, who was added to the eleven. A couple things I want you to see here before we get to point six. <laughs> I really struggled with this part of chapter one. When I was setting up the sermon, I told my wife, I said, I don't think I'm going to cover those last, you know, 12, 13, 14 verses, because they're really kind of irrelevant. And how many of you thank God for your spouse? Because she said to me, you probably need to go back and read that again. God doesn't waste any words. Hmm. You know that's true, right? God doesn't put things in there just because he had a little bit of extra time, <laughs> or it sounded like a good narrative. So I went back and I started reading this, and I saw some things. Number one, I saw that... Um, he renames all of the disciples. Yeah. Now put your finger there because we're coming back to that. That's important. Second thing I saw was this, that they narrowed it down to two guys based on their character, which I thought was really cool. But I thought their method of selection was really amazing. They didn't get a committee together. They didn't ask for resumes. They didn't kick it up the ladder to anybody. They drew lots. And here's my point about that. This is something the Lord had to teach me. When I have to make a critical decision in my life, how many of you have ever had to make a decision and you honestly didn't know what I was telling you? You didn't have a clear picture of which way the Lord was telling you to go. I've done that many times. And I'll never forget, one day the Lord seriously said to me in a really, a decision full of, like, I think the decision was, do we move to Orlando or do we live in St. Pete? Because I had a job opportunity and I could have been in either place. And I finally, like sleepless nights and stuff, finally, I, the Lord is amazing when he talks to me. He, he, I, I'm telling you, he said, dude, because that's how we talk to each other. I don't call him dude, no. He's my father. I call him dad. So I hear, I hear these words, dude. Pick one, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. And I'm like, that's so unspiritual, God. That's not right. He said, either place you go, I've got a plan for your life. That's right. Just pick one. And sometimes, my point is, sometimes maybe it just comes down to being that simple. Maybe both choices are okay. And sometimes I paralyze myself in fear out of making the wrong choice. So the disciples, you know what they did? They gambled. They drew straws. At another point, they cast lots. They rolled dice. That's it. They said, you know what? God knows what's best. Here's the straws. May the best man win according to God's plan. Boom, Matthias wins. <laughs> I'm going to start drawing straws when I have to make decisions, man. But here's the thing. We never hear another word about Matthias. Never hear of him again. So here's what I want you to see. So I asked myself, why does the Lord take the time? Why does Luke take the time to go back and name every disciple? Because that's when I said to my wife, I don't think I'm going to read this part of the passage. It's really kind of busy. Here's why. Number six. I think it's to remind us that God chooses ordinary men. Yeah. <laughs> Put up the next slide, if you would. This is really cool. I did a little study. I have a book. By the way, one of my favorite books, 12 Ordinary Men. I think it's by John MacArthur. I highly recommend it. He gets into the lives of each of the disciples and what they were doing before they came to Christ. Um, just amazing. So look at, these, look at these men. Four of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. 
Now let me tell you what the tax collector does. He's a Jewish man who works for the Roman government taking taxes from Jewish people. They weren't honest because the they find the right word. The more they could scam you out of, they kept a percentage. So often they would just make up a tax figure because they know they get to keep a percentage of that. And if the figure was higher, the percentage is higher, right? So Matthew joining the disciples was probably not a very popular move. So we see fishermen, we see a tax collector, we see a zealot. What is a zealot? Simon was a zealot. Zealots engage in politics and anarchy, attempting to overthrow the Roman government. Gosh, are we seeing that today? We see zealots engaging in anarchy and politics. So when he joined Jesus, he remained zealous, but with allegiance to Jesus rather than a political revolution. And then we know that the rest of the apostles were tradesmen. Philip, James, Judas, and others were just tradesmen. What is my point? <laughs> the point is this. Oh, by the way, at the time they became disciples, all of them were somewhere between 26 and 33 years old. Yes. Now, I'm 60, so that's really young. <laughs> Be prepared. God can use young men. David slew Goliath somewhere around the age of 15 or 16 years old. Mary got pregnant with Jesus probably somewhere around the age of 16 or 17. I'm not advocating teen pregnancy unless the Lord has a word for you. I'm just saying God's not afraid to use young people and do it while your energy is there and you're ready to serve. Say amen. So here's my last point. God uses ordinary people. All of these guys that we mentioned were very ordinary, unassuming, regular people just like you and me. See, I believe this, and I have a slide for this. God specializes in taking ordinary people activated by the power of the Holy Spirit and doing extraordinary things. And that's what this study is all about. It's about taking you and me, I can't speak for you, no special skill sets, nothing spectacular, I have a list of reasons why God shouldn't use me. You might have this, you might have a list too. Like Moses, well, God, you can't use me. I stutter, you know, I don't know how to speak well. I'm shy. I'm probably ugly. I don't know. There's a whole list of reasons why God may not use us. But God specializes in taking ordinary people like a David and a Moses and a Joseph and a Peter and a Judas and a Matthew, filling them with the power of the Holy Spirit and doing extraordinary things. That's what I want you to see in this study. I want you to see how God can empower you with the baptism and the presence of the Holy Spirit to accomplish extraordinary things. Can you do that? Say amen. All right. Did you receive the word this morning? Say yes. Rev kids, uh, all you got to do is tee it up, right? You don't have to go anywhere. All right, don't leave. I have this real quick announcements, very quickly. Number one, um, if you have an offering today, a couple of ways you can do this if you're watching online. By the way, our virtual family, you have been so amazing and faithful at, at bringing offerings in via our Tithely app. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You have blown me away with how generous you've been and the finances of this church have just been marvelous so thank you for watching us on, online those of you who are here live we have our offering basket up front in just a minute i have you come up deposit your offering here in just a moment um, but thank you for your faithfulness uh, this church is very healthy financially and, uh, and we're getting some things done we painted the sanctuary we painted the foyer we fixed up the house we insulated, I mean, we're getting some things done and we're moving towards uh, other things and areas that will benefit the community and the kingdom of God. Say amen. All right, so kids camp, youth camp, those are digital camps that are still happening. Uh, we're probably not going to gather at the church, but if you have been registered and all of our kids are registered, all of our youth are registered, you should be getting emails about camp. It's going to be virtual. Uh, it's going to be crazy. You're going to the zoo virtually. Uh, there's going to be a magician virtually. There's a couple puppet guys virtually. Uh, going to be wild, but you're going to need to log on, on your, at, at home or wherever you are, tablet, computer, phone. So those days are in July. Check our website, thestorehouse.com. Go to the events page. You'll find that. Don't forget, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we're going to take this message and unpack it from your perspective and what God has spoken to you. Don't forget also
uh, 8.30 is our Cornerstone Connection Sunday School. Please be part of Miss Peggy's class. It's amazing. Her attendance is growing on Sundays. And uh, what we're getting into in the book of Daniel has just been uh, really insightful, really amazing. And don't forget, 1115, you're going to shift over to the Rev Kids Facebook page where our Rev Kids uh, leaders, Alex and Alyssa, have teed up today's lesson for you guys. And uh, I'm sure last week, if you didn't catch it, Alex was out there in the pasture with the cows. Did you see that? He was. It was amazing. I thought, man, I'm glad this isn't smell-o-vision. Because he was just out there in the pasture with the guy, and it was amazing. So I don't know where they filmed this week, but we're going to see where it's from. 11.15, that's about six minutes from now. In the meantime, let me pray for you guys. We're going to be dismissed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us live. And uh, let's pray. Father, you're awesome. I love you this morning, Lord. I just love your presence. I love your word. I love the saints, Father God. I love the church the worldwide church of Christ. Help us to stand in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Father, if we've not yet received that power, let us this week seek that power in Jesus' name because you will deliver your promise to us in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Before we disconnect, next week read Acts chapter 2. Very prepared. God bless you.